Hello, my name's Dave Bookless, and this talk is called All of Life. I wonder what your favourite verse is from the Bible. People will have their own favourites, maybe for very personal reasons. For many years, I heard that John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, was the favourite verse in the Bible. But I understand now in our era of social media that that's changed. The most used verse from the Bible in social media is apparently not John 3.16, but Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And I can understand why that is so many people's favourite verse. It's a wonderful phrase of blessing and reassurance and hope. And in a time like ours today of so much uncertainty, so much despair, then words of blessing and prosperity and hope and future are obviously going to make a huge amount of difference to us. But like all biblical promises, Jeremiah 29 11 comes with conditions and comes in a particular context. And we're going to look at that in a few moments. Today, with social media and the internet and bookshops, our lives are full of advice on self-actualization and self-fulfillment, how to be successful, how to make yourself happy, how to have a secure and prosperous life, how to make sure you've got income for your retirement. But are these dreams, these visions of prosperity, the same as what the Bible means when it talks about prosperity? Are these the same as God's future, God's vision of human flourishing, if you like? Are we simply letting our culture shape our vision of the kingdom? Or are we in tune with what God's Spirit is really saying? I want God's blessing on my life in every area. I want to know God's plans. I want to prosper in God's way. I want to have a future filled with hope. Well, if I want that, if all of us want that, then we need to look again at Jeremiah 29, and particularly at the verses that come before verse 11, to understand the context and to see how it applies to us today. You see, Jeremiah 29 was written to a people in exile, a people who had gone through the deep psychological and social trauma of being uprooted from the home that they believed God had brought them to, the promised land, the place where God's temple was, where they believed God lived. They had been dispossessed they had been taken away. They had been brought to a strange land where they spent their time singing songs like, how long shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They wanted to go home. They had not been experiencing God's blessing in their lives. All God's promises from the past, it seemed to have been broken. Promises of the land, a land flowing with milk and honey promises of a place, a temple where they could worship, promises of righteous kings who would lead them and who had now let them down and allowed them to be taken into exile. They were in the opposite of a place of blessing. They were in Babylon, which summed up, if you like, everything that was the opposite of Jerusalem. Babylon was God-forsaken, it was idolatrous, it was confusing, it was a place full of compromise and shame. And all the people wanted was to escape Babylon and go back home. So is that what Jeremiah 29, 11 is promising? A kind of get out of jail free card? Uh, get you back to where you always wanted to be and leave all the problems behind? No. What God says in Jeremiah 29 is something so shocking that I think we can't really imagine what it must have been like for his people to hear. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God sends a letter to the people in Babylon. And I'm gonna read the message version 
of the core of that letter. This is Jeremiah 29, four to seven. This is the message from God of the angel armies, Israel's God, to all the exiles I've taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. Hang on a minute, I've taken? God is saying that he was behind their exile, that he actually brought them to Babylon? Well, let's hold on to that. What does God say to them in Babylon? Build houses and make yourselves at home. Put in gardens and eat what grows in that country. Marry and have children. Encourage your children to marry and have children so that you'll thrive in that country and not waste away. Make yourselves at home there and work for the country's welfare. Pray for Babylon's well-being. If things go well for Babylon, things will go well for you. That is the context for that wonderful promise of prosperity and hope and a future in Jeremiah 29, 11. And we can't really imagine how shocking those words must have been to the people. They were sure that God had taken up residence in Jerusalem. And yet here was God telling them to put down roots in Babylon. 30 years ago, when I first came to the place I still live in, Southall, it felt a, li a little bit like coming to Babylon. It was a confusing place, a place of many different religions, with mosques and gurdwaras and temples on every corner, a place of lots of different languages and cultures, a place when, in a sense, nobody felt at home, where most of the community had come from other parts of the world and often saw Southall simply as a stepping stone to getting to somewhere better. It's not a place where anyone really chose to be. And these words from Jeremiah 29 came to me so powerfully. God wanted me to put down roots in this place, to make myself at home, to plant gardens, to work for the peace and the prosperity of this place and to pray for it. And I believe this passage, more perhaps than almost any passage in the Bible, is God's word to his people today at this time of huge transition in our world. It's a word for today's rootless world because it's about putting down roots wherever God has planted you, even if it's not your forever home, even if it's not your chosen home. But more than that, this passage is about the scope of the gospel. It's about all of life. It gives the secret to God's good plans for prosperity and blessing, to give us a hope and a future, even in exile. It's a message that we could characterize by two words, one from the Old Testament, one from the New. And they're the words shalom, and kingdom. In the Old Testament, the word shalom is often translated as peace, but it means so much more than just an absence of conflict. Shalom means good, healthy, life-giving relationships with yourself, an inner peace, a tranquility, a knowledge that you're in the right place. Peace with your neighbours, with those around you, and in a sense, with your neighbours further afield as well. Peace with God, right at the heart of it, and peace with the creation. Frequently when the Old Testament talks about shalom, it talks about the animals and the land and people all thriving together. A world where the lion can lie down with the lamb, where children don't have to be frightened of poisonous snakes, a place where people will live under their own vines, enjoying the fruit of their labour. This is the vision of Shalom throughout the Old Testament, a vision of restored relationships in every dimension. And in the New Testament, we find that in the Gospels, Jesus preaches the good news, the Gospel of the Kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? Well, quite simply, it's God's rule. 
over all of life. The kingdom is, if you like, the New Testament equivalent of that vision of shalom in the Old Testament. It's a vision of God's rule over every dimension, all our relationships. Letting God be king, not just in our hearts and in our churches, but in our relationships with our neighbours, in our communities, in our civil life and our political life. Letting, letting God be king in our lifestyles, in our relationship with possessions and material things. Letting God be king in terms of the environment and our relationship with God's creation as well. See, what we have here is a vision of the scope of the good news of Jesus Christ. It's not just about individual salvation or personal blessing. It's not even just about churches growing and being blessed. It's a vision of all of life for the whole city, the whole community, and ultimately the whole world. Since the 1970s, the United Nations and lots of other groups following that have talked a lot about sustainable development and sustainability has become one of our buzzwords in the 21st century. And sustainability, sustainable development are based on three pillars, the economic, the social and the environmental. And the idea is that all of these three have to function well in order for development to be sustainable, in order for us to be able to have a good life for human beings to flourish. Well, guess what? Thousands of years before the United Nations came up with the definition of sustainable development, Jeremiah already had it, or rather the Holy Spirit gave it to Jeremiah, because we find each of those dimensions in this passage. You can actually look through the passage and see each of those there. Firstly, make yourself at home, Jeremiah tells the people. Build houses. Put down, if you like, psychological roots in the place where you are. I once gave a talk like this to a group of missionaries who were really struggling with the fact that they were, they had two homes in a sense. They had the place where they'd grown up and they'd come from, and they had the place where God had called them to. And I said to them, you don't have to choose. You can actually be at home in both, but be intentional about being in the home in the place you are now. Similarly, students, you can be at home when you're on campus and you can be at home when you're back home as well. It's about choosing, making yourself at home, saying, I'm gonna put down roots. And then there's the ecological dimension that comes next. Plant gardens and eat what they produce, says Jeremiah. This is so important. Many of us have lost our connection with the land. I remember spending time in Northeast India, in an area where more than 90% of the population were Christian from tribal backgrounds, where people only a couple of generations before had all been subsistence farmers living off the land. And now half the population lived in one city. And I was told there that within two generations, people had lost their connections with the land. They didn't know how to use the herbs that you could find in the forest that had medicinal uses. They didn't know how to grow food. They didn't know the place where they had been planted. And as a result, all kinds of social problems, drug abuse and many other things had started to happen in that city. We are meant to put down roots ecologically in the places where we are. And even if your garden is simply a window box in your apartment, try and grow something. God has, I think, put within every human being the desire to nurture and grow. That's why Adam was planted in a garden and told to tend it and care for it. It's good for us when we do that. So we need to invest ecologically by putting down roots, planting gardens. We need to invest socially. Jeremiah tells the people to continue to get married and have children and for their children to have children. Now, this isn't a, an invitation to overpopulate. This is more about investing in the future. Getting married and having children is a sign that there's a future that's worth hoping for. It's a belief that life is worth 
carrying on with. Today we live in a time where many couples fear about what might happen if they have children. They fear about the kind of world that their children are coming into. A world of climate change and environmental uncertainty and disaster. A world of violence and racial tension. A world where uh, online uh, and social media cause huge psychological pressures for so many people. And Jeremiah is saying, if you have your roots deeply in God and in the place where you are, it's worth investing in the future. So invest ecologically, invest socially, and then invest economically and politically. God tells the people through Jeremiah to be part of the life of the city to which they have called, to work for its welfare. Christians should be involved in every kind of legitimate career and business and in the life of politics of the places where God has put us, from the local level to the national and the international level. The kingdom is about all of life. Shalom is about everything. And you see these three dimensions of sustainable development, the ecological, the social, the economic. There they are in Jeremiah 29, an agenda for us as Christians. But there's one more dimension that the secular agendas usually forget, which is the spiritual dimension. Jeremiah tells the people, pray for the city to which God has called you. Pray for your community. Get down on your knees and ask God to show you his heart for the place where you live. You know, whenever I've got fed up with living where I am now, in an overpopulated, often polluted part of London, I turn to prayer and I ask God to show me his heart for this place and to know how to pray for it properly. Kingdom work is a spiritual battle. There are some wonderful stories, even within our own generations, of times when Christians have come together and have changed the spiritual dynamics, the principalities and powers in places in the world with huge lasting effects. Think of the Christians in South Africa from all sorts of racial backgrounds who gathered together to pray that when apartheid ended, it wouldn't lead to a bloodbath and to civil war. And the commission of reconciliation that came out of that, suggested by Desmond Tutu, was a real direct answer to prayer. Think of Christians in the former East Germany who gathered to pray for the wall to come down. And when that came down again, it was peaceful. These are examples where Christians have gathered to change the sp spiritual atmosphere in a city. So there's this wonderful vision that we have here in Jeremiah 29, which I really believe is God's word for us today. Two mistakes to avoid though. One is to think that God's blessings are the same as our selfish appetites. To think that what we want in terms of material things, in terms of individual satisfaction, are the same as the prosperity or the blessing that God is promising. Our greed, our desire for fame and power, the lie of the prosperity gospel are things we must avoid. This isn't about gathering things for ourselves. Our meaning is found in quality relationships with God, each other and creation. And the other mistake to avoid that sometimes Christians have made too often is that our rewards come only after we die. That we're only going to be happy and find fulfilment when we get to heaven. That this world is something that we have to tolerate and get through rather than actually enjoy. Now the promise of Jeremiah 29 is that God's blessing is for here and now, that we can have a future and a hope. But we find that not in seeking our own selfish satisfaction, but we find it in pouring out ourselves in service for others, for the broken, the fatherless, the lost, and for God's wounded creation. 
If we want to find healing and inner healing for ourselves, we find them by seeking the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, by seeking shalom, by becoming people of peace. And then all these things will be added to us. Then we learn the truth of Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future.